Grace and peace to each and every one of you in the name of our Lord and our Savior, Jesus Christ. And welcome to Amp Hill to worship on this Palm Sunday, uh, even though the triumphal outdoor worship we had planned was put on hold because of some wet conditions this week. We still have quite a number of triumphal entries in the sanctuary this morning. It's great to see the choir sitting back up front. It's great to have Bobby here. Just phenomenal to have you here. Good to be here. Thank you. But of course, the triumphal entry that we celebrate this week um, is the same one that we celebrate every week. That's the arrival of Jesus. And we are the body of Christ. So as we worship God together, we celebrate what God not only is, is doing or has done through Jesus, but what God is doing through us as the church. We seek God's guidance, God's wisdom, strength, courage. Let us prepare our hearts and minds to worship God in that kind of knowledge that we are doing God's will by gathering here together. This Wednesday, not Wednesday, this Thursday, April 1st, we will gather again to worship on Maundy Thursday. Um be our traditional service of lighting the candles and the tenebrae, remembering the last words of Christ and the solemn um, evening of worship. I uh, hate to forego the pancake supper this time. So it, it will be at 6.30. Um, we'll also stream it online. Um, so those of you worshiping from home, I mean, you can bring pancakes here, but you can't eat them and take your mask hey. off. If you're worshiping from home, you can eat pancakes while you worship. Um, and then hopefully, hopefully weather will allow us next Sunday to conduct our Easter worship outside on the front lawn. So we look forward to being together for that. Are there any other um, announcements that are not listed here in the bulletin? That being said, let us prepare our hearts and minds to worship God. The King is coming, I see him coming, open wide the gates. The King is coming, the drums are drumming, open wide the gates. Sing Hosanna, sing Hosanna, sing Hosanna, Hosanna to the King. Sing Hosanna, sing Hosanna, Hosanna to the King. The crowd is cheering and it is appearing, open wide the gate. With branches waving, his way they're paving. Open wide the gates, sing Hosanna, sing Hosanna, sing Hosanna, Hosanna to the King. Sing Hosanna, sing Hosanna, Hosanna to the King. Prophets hold it, now we behold it, open wide the gates, we're done with waiting, we're celebrating, open wide the gates, sing Hosanna, sing Hosanna, sing Hosanna, Hosanna to the King, sing Hosanna, sing Hosanna, Hosanna. Hosanna to the 
Y'all are making me tear up that. <laughs> Your voices are beautiful. I invite us all, whether in body or in spirit, to rise as we call ourselves to worship with the words of the psalmist. Oh, give thanks to the Lord, for he is good. His steadfast love endures forever. Let Israel say, his steadfast love endures forever. Open to me the gates of righteousness, that I may enter through them and give thanks to the Lord. This is the gate of the Lord. The righteous shall enter through it. I thank you that you have answered me and have become my salvation. The stone that the builders rejected has become the chief cornerstone. This is the Lord's doing. It is marvelous in our eyes. This, this is, is the day that the Lord has made. Let, Let us rejoice and be glad in it. it. Our opening hymn number 265. All glory, laud, and honor. Let us sing. Mm -hmm. On this day, Palm Sunday, we praise the King of Kings with heart and life and voice, not only with outward signs such as palm branches or the occasional Hosanna, but with lives that are truly turned towards him. This present day, Palm Sunday, seems so far away from that day when Jesus 
entered Jerusalem with the shouts of the crowd ringing in his ears, welcomed as a king and yet riding on a lowly donkey, greeted with cheers and acclamations, which turned quickly to jeers and condemnation. From this side of the resurrection, we confidently believe that we could never have been part of the jeering crowd. But would we, if we had been there? Let us pray. Lord Jesus Christ, when our words and actions reflect a reluctance to confess you publicly as Lord of our lives, forgive us. us. When we fear that humbling ourselves would be seen by others as weakness or some kind of defect in our character, forgive, forgive us. us. When we have betrayed your love for us, through our lack of love for you, for others, and for ourselves. Forgive, Forgive us. us. When we find ourselves glossing over the events of your passion and death, because we look forward to Easter as a time to enjoy holidays and have fun. Forgive, Forgive us. us. Lord Jesus Christ, fix your mind in us and remake us in your likeness. Empty us of all that hinders us from following you to where pain and suffering, exploitation, and injustice exist. Gracious, Gracious and loving God, empower us with the Holy Spirit so that our lives continually glorify you and our tongues forever confess Jesus as Lord. This we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. <clears throat> Hear the good news. Jesus, though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God as something to be exploited. But he emptied himself, taking the form of a slave and became obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. Through his obedience, we are therefore free from whatever sin enslaves us. Thanks, Thanks be, be to God. God. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Ghost, as it was in the beginning, is now and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. Amen. I'm not the minister. I'm <laughs> just doing the hunger offering. <clears throat> and of course, today is Palm Sunday, the Sunday before Easter. It is the day that we remember and celebrate the day Jesus entered Jerusalem as Savior and King. And I've got a little story to tell you. It says, a few years ago, this lady's son spent a week with his cousin in Norfolk. When it was time for him to come home, he asked my husband and I to come and get him at Harrington, Delaware, the halfway point between Norfolk and their home in North Jersey. <clears throat> we all arrived at Harrington late at night, so both families decided to stay at a hotel. Little did we know that it was a Delaware County Fair taking place in town, and all the hotels were booked. We tried many establishments, but were told <clears throat> there was no room. Just before deciding to sleep in the Walmart parking lot, <laughs> We tried one last hotel. I said a prayer to my guardian angel and asked for a place for myself and my weary family members to stay. Betty, the hotel manager, told us that while they didn't have any rooms available, we could stay the night in the hotel lobby. 
It was a little uncomfortable, but it was a safe place to sleep. The next morning, we thanked Betty and continued on our journeys to both North Jersey and Virginia, respectively. A few months later, my husband and I were going to Virginia and stopped at the same hotel to bring cookies to Betty to thank her for her kindness. When we asked the desk clerk if Betty was working, we were told there was not a Betty working there. I knew then that Betty had been my guardian angel and who had heard my prayer and made sure that we all had a safe place to stay for the evening. When I was a child, my mother would tell me wonderful stories about the guardian angels. I even had a picture of one hanging in my bedroom. I always said that a guardian angel prayer every night before I went to bed. I'm grateful for the encounter and I'm blessed to have with Betty and for her kindness when we needed her most. And our prayers are kind of answered with our hunger offerings when we get, <coughs> excuse me, for the Presbyterian religious group. And we feed as many people as we can in our areas or in countries other than ours. I'm going to get a prayer now. Oh, I can't breathe in this thing. <laughs> <laughs> Lord God, we pray for everyone who is hungry today. Whether they live thousands of miles away or in our local communities. Lord, we ask for wisdom for leaders and experts working to tackle hunger. Lord, you let us know what hunger is, but you also know the goodness of your provisions. We pray for those who share the earth with us, but for whom hunger is crippling, life-threatening danger. We pray for those who have nothing and those who have too little to eat. Would you help them and allow us to be part of that solution? In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you, Mary Jane. And as always, if you would like to send in a contribution to the hunger offering and our worshiping, um, apart from us in the sanctuary, you can just put a memo on the check that designates it as a part of the hunger offering and we'll make sure it gets managed accordingly. But thank you all for your continued generosity to that ministry. Let us turn to God in prayer as we approach the word of God for us this day. God of wisdom and love, send your spirit to fill us and to fill this place, to empty us just as Jesus emptied himself that we might be filled not only with your wisdom, but with the will to obey and follow you. <laughs> Give us courage to listen and strength to act on what we learn. It is in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. Amen. Yeah. First off, we've been jumping all over the, the 12th chapter of, of John, the last couple of weeks, that starts off with Mary washing Jesus' feet with perfume and drying it off with her hair. And then there's this plot to kill Lazarus. And then we get today's entry into Jerusalem. Then he goes to the temple and drives out the money changers. And then I'm going to actually add another three verses on before we get a summary of Jesus's teachings at the end of the chapter. But this is from verses 12 through 16. When the great, uh, I'm sorry, <clears throat> 12. The next day, the great crowd that had come to the festival heard that Jesus was coming to Jerusalem. So they took branches of palm trees and went out to meet him, shouting, Hosanna, blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord, the King of Israel. Jesus found a young donkey and sat on it, 
As it is written, do not be afraid, daughter of Zion. Look, your king is coming, sitting on a donkey's colt. His disciples did not understand these things at first. But when Jesus was glorified, then they remembered that these things had been written of him and had been done to him. And now, uh, starting at verse 41, and continuing through the end of the chapter. Or 40. He has blinded their eyes and hardened their heart so that they might not look with their eyes and understand with their heart and turn, and I would heal them. Isaiah said this because he saw his glory and spoke about him. Nevertheless, many, even of the authorities, believed in him. But... Because of the Pharisees, they did not confess it for the fear that they would be put out of the synagogue. For they loved human glory more than the glory that comes from God. Then Jesus cried aloud, whoever believes in me, believes not in me, but in him who sent me. And whoever sees me, sees him who sent me. I have come as light into the world, so that everyone who believes in me should not remain in the darkness. I do not judge anyone who hears my words and does not keep them, for I came not to judge the world, but to save the world. The one who rejects me and does not receive my word has a judge. On the last day, the word that I have spoken will serve as judge. For I have not spoken on my own, but the Father who sent me has himself given me a commandment about what to say and what to speak. And I know that his commandment is eternal life. What I speak, therefore, I speak just as the Father has told me. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks Thanks be be to God. God. So here is my paraphrase of John 12, 41 through 43. People believed what Jesus was teaching and doing, but they were afraid to publicly support him because the people in power particularly the religious leaders, did not endorse him. They didn't want to be kicked out of the synagogue, so they appealed to the public posturing of the Pharisees, even though by doing so, they showed more reverence for human power than God's grace. And then Jesus makes an exclamation. He cries aloud, And it reinforces the claim that John made about him in the beginning. That he is the word of God and has come like a light to the world that we might see and understand who God is and what God is doing. And God is not condemning the world like the Pharisees might have scared you into believing but saving it. Jesus' mission, claims Jared Sloyan, is thus identical with the work of God of Israel as the Hebrew scriptures and Judaism see it. This means Jesus' ministry ought to have stood up against the scrutiny of the Pharisees who had memorized all of God's commandments. So, Why instead did they criticize him? Perhaps unrelated, uh, but I wonder if the Pharisees would have responded differently than Jesus did when approached by Satan in the wilderness, offering them unlimited power. Just kidding, that's actually really related. (laughs) Knowing the commandments is how you keep the Torah. And for the Pharisees, that is what made them holy. 
and, and, and venerable and worthy of respect and deserving of power. Of course, they would have chosen power. In fact, it seems to me that the major source of conflict between them and Jesus is that his ministry is trying to reveal the source of their power, their acquiescence to the ruler of this world. And here's the thing. I'm not sure the Pharisees even knew that they had done this. So Jesus is trying to open their eyes just as much as he's trying to open everyone else's. Satan likes to make people feel good. Feel right. He's not going to judge them or make them feel guilty. So go for power, he says. I'll help you get it. Go for the forbidden fruit. God's the bad guy here trying to limit your possibilities and make you feel guilty for wanting what is good in life. Serving Satan feels good. It feels powerful. Sin, in lieu of this, can be defined as choosing to serve the love of power over the power of love. Pharisees loved their power. They loved their prominence. Jesus saw through it. Beware the yeast of the Pharisees. That is their hypocrisy. Their hypocrisy will spread through a community the way that a pinch of yeast leavens a batch of dough. Pharisees claimed they knew what was wrong and what was right, and therefore they had the power to judge who was and who wasn't a sinner completely blind to their own sin, their love of power. Jesus' claim that God has told him what to say is important. But what we must understand is that Jesus not only spoke the word of God, he embodied it. He was the word with a capital W of God made flesh. He was the power of love incarnate. But the Pharisees only saw a threat to their love of power. Now, because of this, Jesus' embodiment of and obedience to God's word often set him at odds with the claims of the Pharisees and the customs by which they had confined the community through these claims. Jesus' ministry exposed the preposterous nature of the notion that the commandments of God were confining. He also exposed the Pharisees' condemnation of so-called sinners as being incompatible with the will of God. Whereas the Pharisees' spoken word condemned such outcasts, Jesus' embodied word welcomed them at the table where they could share communion with God. As Walter Wink summarizes, Jesus distinguishes between those falsely called sinners who are in fact the victims of an oppressive system of exclusion and true sinners whose evil is not ascribed to them by others, but who have sinned from the heart. In such acts as breaking bread with social outcasts, touching and healing the sick, and teaching the poor that they are the beloved of God to whom God's kingdom belongs, Jesus is embodying the will of God. It's not only by the words he speaks, but by his very embodiment of God's word that we can see that what he says is true. He came not to judge the world, but to save the world. Jesus' life and ministry quite literally released captives. Those who had been imprisoned by the ideology of the Pharisees, wherein holiness was equated with separation, which 
in practice looked a lot like the expulsion of the poor, sick, and presumably unimportant from the social and religious circles of the wealthy, healthy, and powerful. The rules of ritual purity had been used to keep the various people and parts of society in their proper place, says Wink. The Pharisees' love of power perverted this purity and perpetuated this system of exclusion. Their power structure, under the guise of religion, permitted the persecution of sinners and kept people in their place, imprisoned by fear and shame. Without purity regulations, there would be a crisis of distinctions in which everyone and everything was the same. Women equal to men. Outsiders equal to insiders. The, the sacred, no different from the profane. Gentile would be no different than Jew. Clean people would sit at the table with unclean people. No one would be better in God's sight. Socially imposed shame about the body keeps people submissive to societal authority by weakening them in the immediacy of their own sense of what is right. Without such shame, what becomes of societal authority? The Pharisees truly thought that this system was serving God. They were so blinded by their love of power that they were unable to see the satanic influences their leadership was having on society, even when Jesus laid it bare in front of them. The thing is, even Satan thought he was serving God. All Jesus wanted the Pharisees to see was the threat that Satan's power and influence posed to a loving and compassionate community. But all they were able to see was a threat to their power and influence. In lieu of this, Jesus' triumphal entry into Jerusalem can thus be viewed as a powerful parody of the prevailing powers. In doing so, he shattered the shackles of shame with which the powerful subdued the least of these. He made a mockery of their pomp and circumstance, riding the foal of an ass through the gates of Jerusalem. Upon his entry, he was hailed as the king of Israel, but his crowning achievement came a week later when he was crowned with thorns. This was a last-ditch attempt by the powers that be to subject him to the system of shame and domination that he was so deftly exposing and destroying. They mocked him in hopes of undercutting the authority and appeal of his teaching. They crucified him the most shameful, dishonoring, and humiliating way to die with the belief that they were also putting to death the subversive threat of the coming kingdom about which he was always teaching. But they didn't succeed. At least I hope they did. The kingdom of God continues to invade this world through those who believe in the resurrection. Do we believe? Do we believe that the word of God cannot be destroyed. To believe in the resurrection is to believe that God's word still has something to say to this world. Not to condemn it, but to save it. The powers that be want us to feel powerless, inadequate, unworthy, ashamed. Jesus wants to unshackle us from shame. Yet, the one who rejects him and does not receive his word has a judge. Their shackles are built into the system of sin they choose to serve instead of God's kingdom. Now, it's important to recognize 
that Jesus isn't saying there won't be any condemnation, but rather I can rescue you from it. If you don't want to be condemned, serve Satan. He won't judge you. If you want to be condemned, serve Jesus and be rescued from Satan. Satan will make you feel good, right? He'll make you feel right. He'll make you feel powerful. But if we choose to serve the God of love and follow Jesus Christ, then there will be condemnation. Because there are still things in this world that serve the love of power over the power of love. As we read last week, those who hate their life in this system of sin will preserve their life for eternity. If we are to serve the God of love, then must we not condemn the love of power? If we are to preserve life in the kingdom of God, must we not condemn those things which restrict, oppress, and destroy life? Must we not condemn racism? And not merely with lip service, but with the embodied love of God? And must we not condemn senseless violence, especially gun violence? And not merely with empty words of thoughts and prayers and condolences, but with action born from compassion and empathy. Must we not condemn the impulse to protect gun ownership at all costs rather than protect human life? at all costs. The conversation around gun rights and gun restrictions has been shackled to fear and shame. And it's a conversation in which knowing what to say is quite difficult. It's also a conversation that has been heavily stigmatized as too political to talk about in church. But this is not a political issue. It is a theological one. Deeply theological. At its heart is the struggle between love of power and power of love. The influence of Satan versus the salvation of God. And let me be clear before I go any further that I have not just said, and nor am I saying, that gun ownership is satanic. No. All of the gun owners that I have ever spoken with have tremendous respect for the amount of power that a gun possesses and the life or death importance of respecting that power. But what I struggle with, however, are the arguments and pushbacks and the all too familiar discourse following a mass shooting or incidents of gun violence, which seek to protect ownership of more and more powerful and deadly firearms. At some point, the line between respect for power and love of power blurs. And that's when it gets dangerous. Why is it that we feel afraid or ashamed to speak out against how preposterous it is that any civilian should have the ability to access and own a fully automatic military assault style weapon? Fear and shame are the weapons of sin to intimidate us and keep us from confronting and condemning the ways in which Satan has blinded this world. And they are effective. They make us doubt that God can really save us. Maybe I need to save myself. In the mid-60s, the Presbyterian Church began calling the nation's attention to the gun violence that was tearing apart our inner cities. And in 1990, they issued a warning the religious community must take seriously the risk of idolatry that could result from an unwarranted fascination with guns that overlooks or ignores the social consequences of their misuse. James Atwood, a gun owner and Presbyterian minister, wrote a theological expose on the American gun culture in which he claims, in short, I believe a gun becomes an idol when the following conditions prevail. One, an owner believes that there are no circumstances 
when a regulation or restriction for the public safety should be placed upon it. Two, an owner believes that guns don't kill, they only save lives. And three, an owner has no doubt that guns preserve America's most cherished values. Violence is the ethos of our times, writes Walter Wink. It is the spirituality of the modern world. It has been accorded the status of a religion, demanding of its devotees an absolute obedience to death. Its followers are not aware, however, that the devotion they pay to violence is a form of religious piety. Violence is successful as a myth precisely because it does not seem to be mythic in the least. Violence simply appears to be the nature of things. It is what works. It is inevitable, the last and often the first resort in conflicts. It is embraced with equal alacrity by people on the left and on the right, by religious liberals and religious conservatives. The threat of violence, it is believed, alone can deter aggressors. Some would argue that the threat of nuclear annihilation has brought the world peace. Violence is thriving as never before in every sector of American popular culture, civil religion, nationalism, and foreign policy. Violence, not Christianity, is the real religion of America. I only say what God has commanded me to say, Jesus remarks. Sometimes knowing what to say is hard, especially when it goes against prevailing traditions and customs, but that didn't stop Jesus from saying what needed to be said, from speaking out against the Pharisees, from embodying perfect love and compassion in a culture that stigmatized it as weakness and foolishness, from calling Satan out from hiding to expose his influence and manipulation, from condemning the death-dealing ways of this world in order that the beloved children of God might be saved. Let us not distract ourselves from this, I think nor from the necessary conversation that needs to take place in our culture. Remembering that this is not a political matter, but a theological one. And, and Satan doesn't want us to realize that it's theological. Because Jesus, the word of God, the power of love, cannot be destroyed. And against it, the love of power doesn't stand a chance. And Jesus has shown us God's will. That we might be saved. Released from the shackles of fear and shame imposed on us by idolatrous powers. And that we and others might live. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. Amen. Our hymn of response is number 267, Hosanna, loud Hosanna. <laughs> Thank <laughs> you.
Continuing together, we respond with the words of the Apostles' Creed, affirming our faith. Christians, what do you believe? I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he arose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth on the right hand of God, the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Please be seated. Let us pray. We are indeed your body, O oh God. Your beautiful, beloved body. Each member is gifted from you and by you in such unique ways. We give of those gifts. And when we do, the harmony that we create, the beauty that we create, with the intent of listening to you and serving your will, gives us a foretaste of your kingdom here on earth. That's why we seek to serve you more and more with more and more of our being, with more and more of our heart and soul and mind. Take the financial gifts that we give and bless them for use in ministries that will also serve your will and way. But most of all, oh God, bless this body that it might be one that it might know its beauty and the power that it has in love, your love. May all that we do seek to serve and glorify you and your love for all of us and all of creation. As we pray in Jesus' name, amen. <laughs>
Let us pray for one another and for our world. Holy God, in your purposes and will, there is salvation for us and for this world. A redemption between your vision for creation, the kingdom to which you call us. And the world which has been created by sin. We stand in the tension between the two as they both fight for our loyalty. And it sucks to be stuck there. It's a tough place to be. But this holy week, we can see that you know full well what it is like to be in a terrible place because you chose that, that we might trust you, that we might know your love and we could be loyal to it. We pray for those in our congregation, in our family, and our friends who are in tough places, whether they are financially tough, whether it's due to poor health, whether it's due to healing, depression, loneliness, doubt, Temptation. We especially lift up this morning Lynn and Jim and Tricia, Mary and Floyd, Joanne, Bobby and Ree, and Martha and Kim and Betty. And we lift up to you in silence those names which are in our hearts and on our minds constantly. You know, oh God, what it's like to be in their shoes because... You are there. You are with each and every one of us and each and every one of the people for whom we pray. Help us to trust that that is true. Help us to see in the cross your willingness to preserve our life at all costs. Your willingness to let there be no distance too great to keep you from loving us. Now may the same be true in reverse. May we serve you. May we obey your will. May we follow your son and our savior, Jesus Christ. Looking to him for the example of how to set our feet in this world and how to shine our heart upon others. We learn from him the words to pray that guide our hearts and minds in that right direction. So together we pray, our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our sins as we forgive our debtors and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. 
are closing him right on in majesty. Minds, it's not just of Jesus, but also of the one that we follow from this place. Let us rise and sing together. <laughs> God loves you, and I love you. Go in the knowledge that the Son of God, God's love for you incarnate, would stop at nothing to get you to trust that. May you be showered, surrounded, filled with the love of God, emboldened by the grace of Christ. And made one body by the Spirit go forth to love God and to love one another. Shalom.